Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 130. Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra little snippets of travel, history, and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And we're featuring two great guests in this episode. So our feature interview is with Sue Matten, who's the crochet designer behind The Mercery. And Sue's interview is in two parts, and both parts are jam-packed with information. I was really impressed with the beauty of Sue's designs and the depth of her knowledge, both as an artist and as a teacher, because Sue is very skilled at describing her design process. So in part one of the interview, Sue shows us how she'll take a section of a painting that inspires her and using her Kaleidoscope app, she'll mirror that section in four ways. And that creates a very balanced image, which then becomes the basis or inspiration for a new crochet design. It's a really fascinating process to watch and it'll get you itching to try out the process yourself. And Sue is also a really good teacher and she loves to encourage people to move away from just mechanically reproducing her designs to instead using her designs as a starting point for people to develop and create their own. And in part two of the interview, Sue shows us a series of very playful activities that really help to demystify the whole creative process. So I think you're going to find this interview invaluable as a learning resource because I learned so much just from watching it multiple times while I was editing it. Our second guest is a knitter of the world from South Africa. Noma Ndlovu is the designer behind Bigger Than Life Knits and she has a fascinating knitting story. She was knitting professionally from the age of seven under her aunt's direction yeah. and having started her training so early, it's natural that she's a very technically proficient knitter, but she's also an intelligent and thoughtful designer who focus, focuses particularly on the extreme ends of the size spectrum with an emphasis on achieving a great fit and developing a capsule wardrobe. We think you'll love her designs. On top of that, Mum has started a new project in which she's yeah. already experienced some interesting gauge issues. I'm going to show you my finished hooked rug and I'll update you on my knitted chess set. So we'll start with me in under construction. Yep. And as Madeline said, I have started a new project and I am having my usual gauge issues with it, but I'm really excited about it. It's a gorgeous design, so I'll start by showing you a picture of it. So here's the lovely Natasha Hornby modeling her own design, which is called Mayron. I fell in love with the design as soon as I saw it. It's a modern take on the intricately embroidered bodices found in folk costumes from various cultures. And as many of you know by now, I really love costumes. And here's a close-up picture of the gorgeous stitch pattern. So it has a very clever sideways construction to get the patterning in vertical panels. And that's done using a contrast color in slipped stitches or mosaic knitting. And the little flowers are created by wrapping the yarn multiple times around a cluster of three stitches. And I think the effect just looks fantastic. So before I explain my gauge issues, I think it's best if I show you how the sweater's constructed because it's really quite brilliant and it makes for such an interesting knitting experience. So this is the knitting that I've done so far. And I think I'm gonna stick it on. It's got some circular needles in it. If I stick it on, you'll see how it works, I think, in a, in a more simple way. Okay, and I'll use this needle as a pin to try to hold it in place. Okay, so you start here in the upper sleeve with a provisional cast on. And for any new viewers, a provisional cast on or new knitters, a provisional cast on means that your stitches are still live and you can pick them up later and knit down in the opposite direction. So the upper sleeve is worked in the round and then the shoulders are shaped with short rows here. Once you've worked to about this section here, you're going to cast on stitches along the sides here for the body. And you do that with a double sided provisional cast on, which is going to give you an invisible side seam. So I don't know if you can see that, but there's no side seam there. I'm going to come back and talk about a double sided provisional cast on in a minute because it's a really cool technique. But after you've cast on your stitches along the sides for the body, you're going to knit sideways. So in this direction here. And that's because you, um, Natasha wanted this uh, mosaic knitting or slip stitch pattern here to be in vertical panels. If she was to knit it uh, 
in the normal direction, they would end up being horizontal panels. So that's how she's achieved that effect. So you start by knitting the right side of the front and then you do the right side of the back and you knit that until you get to the center point which is in the middle of the body and then you stop and you do exactly the same thing for the other side of the sweater but in reverse. So once you've knitted the right half of the sweater and the left half of the sweater separately, if you were to put them on, it would look like you're wearing a sweater, or in my case, a t-shirt, that's been cut directly up the center front and directly up the center back. And you're going to join both halves of the sweater with a center front seam and a center back seam. And those seams will be done in a three needle, a modified three needle bind off. So that's the really interesting part of the construction. After that, the knitting is fairly straightforward. So you get go back to your original provisional cast on, pick up your stitches and you knit the sleeves in the round downwards. And that's really cool because once you've got the body fitting you, you can decide how long you want the sleeves. So you could make them elbow length or bracelet length depending on, on how the rest of it looks. Then you're gonna pick up stitches around the neckline and knit the neckband and you'll also pick up stitches around the bottom of the garment to knit the waistband and that's also cool to be able to do this right at the end because it means that depending on how it fits you you can add length or make the garment shorter because you're knitting downwards in this direction so now I want to get back and talk to you about the double-sided provisional cast on because it's such a cool technique and this was the first time I've ever done it so what you're seeing here is the side of the garment underneath the armhole and this is what it looks like after the double-sided provisional cast on has been worked in both directions. So you can see that it's totally seamless and it's a very cool technique. To do a double-sided provisional cast on, you start by crocheting a chain in a smooth waist yarn with slightly more stitches than you need to knit. So I needed 70 stitches, so I crocheted around 78 chain stitches. I then knitted up my 70 stitches from the pearl bumps on the back of the crochet chain. After that, I worked one row in pearl, which joined the newly cast on stitches to my sleeve. And then with a spare needle, much smaller in size than what I'm knitting with, I picked up the pearl bumps of the stitches that I've just cast on. And this time I'm not picking up from the crochet chain, Instead, I'm picking up the pearl bumps of the main blue yarn. And again, I pearl the new stitches that I've just picked up from the pearl bumps. And this is what it looks like after I've worked a couple of rows. You then unpick the crochet chain and you're ready to work the front and the back of the sweater as one piece. So even though it looks like I'm knitting in the round, you're actually working back and forth in knit rows and purl rows. So that demonstration wasn't meant to be a full comprehensive tutorial. It's just to give you a look at how the double-sided provisional cast on works. So I am sure that most of you have been looking at my knitting and thinking that it's only gonna fit a child. And I had the same problem with my modest. Yeah, <laughs> and you're kind of right. The thing is, I nearly always want to knit at a tighter gauge than what most patterns recommend. So, and that's because I'm quite obsessed with getting very fine, a fine, even fabric that's almost, that looks almost machine knit. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm a little bit too ex obsessed with it, but it means that I'm nearly always recalculating the stitch counts of patterns to fit my preferred gauge. But this time, I think I did it in a bit of a hurry and I was a bit sloppy with my calculations and so I made a mistake. So with this design, the stitch gauge and the row gauge are really important. And can I actually get you to hold this yes, for me? Yes, of course. Just hold it like that. So the stitch gauge, because it's the body is knitted sideways, the stitch gauge is really important because it gives you the length. And the row gauge will give you the width. So I'm choosing to knit at 26 stitches per 10 centimeters instead of the recommended 23 stitches. So what happened is when I 
I cast on stitches with the double-sided provisional cast on along the sides here. I took a stitch count from a larger size and I also added stitches to that, but nevertheless, it was still short. And so it's too short in the body. But what's really interesting is that although my stitch gauge is smaller than the recommended stitch gauge, my row gauge ended out to be exactly the same size as the recommended row gauge. So that means your stitches are quite elongated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it must mean that. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, I'm because I'm using really beautiful yarn and I'm actually really excited to make this design into something that looks beautiful and fits, fits me very well, I'm going to rip right back to the double-sided provisional cast on and add even more stitches so I get more length in the body. That's so sad. <laughs> you put so much effort into these flower patterns here. Yeah. Yes, these cluster flower patterns, they look totally stunning, but they do take quite a lot of time. Mm. But that's okay because I am really motivated to do a good job of this design. So that's an update on my new project. I think I'm back on track and it should be smooth sailing from now on. And now it's your turn. You're going to show us your chess set pieces. Yeah. So we're still in under construction. This knitted chess set is a design by the UK toy designer Alan Dart. Last episode I showed you my chess board, which I finished, and it's ginormous, I absolutely love it. Um, and since then I've knitted the white rooks and three new playing pieces. All the chess pieces are knitted with DK weight yarn on 3mm needles. I'm using the recommended yarn, but instead of sticking with the traditional black and white, I've chosen some additional colours to give my chess pieces more individuality. <laughs> um, you can take this as far as you like and get really creative, but their allegiance, since it's a game, has to be clearly visible. Yeah. So maybe the colour palette shouldn't be too broad. But I think you've done a good choice. I think it's going to look great. Well, you did help me with the colours, actually. Yeah. <laughs> So that was a compliment to yourself, <laughs> but I agree. Um, okay. So the pawns actually enjoy the most freedom. They get to wear, well, the white pawns get to wear any pastel color they like, while my black pawns get to wear dark smoldering colors. Yeah, but so I you're wanted... starting another dark pawn That's there right. with this color. Yes. Okay, so this is an going to fit in with that color range. Yeah. Yep. Um, I did want the king and queen to be the trendsetters for the higher ranking pieces in the back row. And this is so that the chess piece or the chess set doesn't look too chaotic. Um, yeah, so let's start with the king. Actually, no, first of all, I'll explain. Uh, the king and queen are wearing a combination of royal red and dark purple. So that means that my rooks have purple flags. My knight is wearing purple armor and the bishops will probably wear light purple robes with um, with the royal red as stoles. So I, I think love the knight. Cool. He's a bit wobbly. He doesn't have a good seat on He's his horse. He's a very happy knight. <laughs> <laughs> but the horse is a very pretty horse. He's rearing his horse. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's start with the king. The king is made up of 10 different pieces which you then sew together. Starting with the head, you use the same color that you'll use for the cloak. In my case, it's dark purple, and this is the cap that is worn underneath the crown. Then you change to the skin tone for the face, and the robe is knitted in royal red, and just like with the pawns, the arms are knitted separately. I like how the robe includes just touches of dark purple around the cuffs and hem. The cloak is also knitted separately, mainly in stocking stitch, but with a garter stitch trimming along the sides to match the cast off edging. The hair and beard are knitted in reverse stocking stitch with the pearl side facing outwards and this makes it look like stylized wavy hair, which I think is a great addition. And finally, you knit his sword. You start with a blade and cast on several stitches and immediately cast them off again. And then you do the same thing for the hilt. Finally, you glue them both together to create the complete sword, which is then glued onto the, the king, onto his chest, and you sort of shape his arms I think they even get glued on. Yeah, yeah. they gl get glued onto the sword as well to make him look like he's holding the sword. He's my favourite. I he's think he looks groovy. the most impressive. Yes. And you've made his little gown a little bit longer so it kind of trails along behind him. Yeah, he's looking very <laughs> royal. I also love, even though it's such a small detail, I love the little cross on the top here. Yeah. It makes the crown look more impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then came the queen who, as I said before, is wearing the same colours as the king. My favorite part about her outfit are definitely the bell sleeves. I think they're super cool. Um, the sleeves and the collar are knitted separately and then sewn onto the body and the arms. 
Uh, the queen is also wearing a dark purple skirt and a bodice in royal red. And these are knitted together in one piece along with the head. Okie yeah, dokie. I think she's very pretty. She is, but the I think the king trumps. trumps she's not her. supposed to. The queen is supposed to I trump. Know. She's the most important <laughs> figure. Okay. Or the most powerful. Yeah. Anyway, then I knitted a black uh, knight. And the knight sits very proudly on his little horsey and has his sword raised into the air, all ready to charge into battle. You start with the horse by knitting the body, the head, ears and mane separately and sewing them together. And then you knit the knight, who is constructed a bit differently from the other figures. I think the horse is really cool. The shape of the horse's head and the mane have worked really well. Yeah. I think so too, although it does look a little bit like he's just sitting on the horse's neck. <laughs> and he is a bit wobbly, as you can see, but he stays he stays in his seat. He doesn't fall off. He's an active <laughs> figure. He has to move around. It's the horse. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool to play with these. Yeah. They're, okay. they, they're a bit addictive. So Let's tell us how this one was constructed. Yeah, so you knit the head and body in one piece, but then you stop after his bottom because he's not wearing a long gown, but armour... You see his legs and feet, so they need to be knitted separately from the body, just like the arms are. Next comes his helmet and visor. In the original design, they are the same colour as the body, but I thought it would look cool to have them in the same colour as the sword, like metal, to set them apart from the body. And finally, the last pieces I made were the white rooks. I talked about the black rooks and how they're constructed in episode 128, so I won't go into that now. But the black rooks have purple flags to match their king and queen. My white rooks have blue flags, so that gives you a hint as to what colours I'm going to use for my white king and queen. It's really exciting. The more pieces that you add, like since we've added these three pieces, you can really see how they're all going to go together mm -hmm. very well. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's very exciting adding more and more pieces to the set. Yeah, I'm finding it quite addictive to create my two little armies. It's really fun. <laughs> okay, so coming up next is part one of our interview with Sue Matten, who's the crochet designer behind the Mercery. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. Today we're in Norwich, which is on the east coast of England, and I'm with the crochet designer Sue Matten. I only recently came across Sue's work and I was immediately impressed by the beauty of her designs and the depth of her knowledge, and I definitely wanted to feature her work on Fruity Knitting. Luckily for us, Sue has agreed. So here we are today in her studio and we've prepared a lot to share with you. So thank you for inviting us here. Oh, it's my pleasure, Andrea. Thank you so much for, for coming to visit me. Good. So before the viewers have a look at your designs, I'd really like them to hear about your background because you're actually highly qualified as a textile artist and teacher. So let's start with a summary of your journey so far. Okay. So um, at 16, I went to art school and I did a diploma in fashion design. And then straight after that, I decided that I wanted to specialise in knitwear design. So I did a degree at De Montfort University. And after graduating quite quickly, I went into teaching. So I was teaching in my local FE college and I taught on a broad range of art and design courses. And then after about 10 years of teaching, I felt that I just wanted to explore my own practice a bit more. So I took a two year sabbatical and I went to Goldsmiths University and I did a postgraduate diploma in textiles, which was amazing. Introduced me to all sorts of different creative practices that I'd never considered before. And then after that, I did an MA in textiles at Norwich. And um, that allowed me to really develop my creative writing. And I was looking at filmmaking and animation, um, textile history. And then after I graduated from the MA course, I began teaching there. 
at the university uh, at the university in Norwich on the MA yeah. textiles course. Which and were you was teaching wonderful. subjects you'd been learning textile subjects? Basically? Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. It was all very much led by my own practice, which was a really great experience. Um, and then I continued teaching in FE for another ten years. And then just decided that I was going to leave academia and start my own business. So in 2012, I launched the Mercery um, with no business experience. And it's been a bit of a slow grow. Um, but here I am 10 years later and running online courses. Yeah. OK, so that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of qualifications behind you and a lot of experience in sharing with people and your own skills, but also helping them develop their own, which is I find very interesting. Now, your business name actually comes from the French word for haberdashery, haberdashery the mercery. And right. like you said, you've studied textile history. So is there an interesting historical connection to the name? Oh, absolutely. So as you said, it's, it's a French word for haberdashery. Um, but also Mercer um, is a word in the English language as well. It was a word for a textile merchant historically. And Norwich, where I live and where I'm from, it's got a really rich history of textile manufacture and trading. And um, in the 19th century, Norwich was famous for the Norwich shawls, which were traditionally red. They used a lot of red um, madder dye. And there was, in fact, a colour called Norwich Red in the 19th century. OK. And we used so much madder in Norwich at the time that people said that the rivers ran as red as blood. <laughs> Imagine that. There's always these romantic descriptions of them. So let's have a look at some of your designs now. I particularly want the viewers to see your gorgeous heirloom blankets that are supported by online courses. But first, just tell us what's important to you in your work, both as a teacher and a designer. Okay, so in my own work, in my own practice, I like to make functional objects. Um, the things that I'm really drawn to are pattern, repeating pattern and colour. And so for me, really a blanket is just a vehicle. It's just a really easy way of exploring all of those things in a very simple format. Um, so, so I like to use um, really dynamic colours and I'm interested in how shapes and patterns fit together. And so in my teaching work, I really see these designs as an opportunity for people to, to take it as a point of departure. So they can take the general concept of the design, but they can make it their own. Mm -hmm. So I help them choose their own colours, and I help them really see that they can play a role, that they can take some ownership over the design. So it's not all about me as the designer, it's about how I can help other people create really beautiful objects themselves. Okay, so they're not just reproducing something you've already finished and created, they're using it as a starting point to just explore their own work in a way. It's like a helping hand for them. Yes, definitely. And some people like to kind of stick to the rules and will do product products that look very much like my originals and other people will just really take the idea and run with it and, and, and create something that is completely unique and very individual. Sue's got her blankets hanging up so we're going to go somewhere else now and then she's going to go through them and, and also describe what her courses involve. So this is the first blanket that I designed as a course, as a six-month course and this really came out of a conversation that I had with a group of crocheters that I was working with in my local yarn shop in Norwich and we'd just finished a project and they said to me, well, what are we going to do next, Sue? And I didn't really have a plan. So they said, well, we'd really like to do a granny square blanket. And I thought, OK, I'm not sure that I'm very excited by that concept. So anyway, I went away and I thought about it. And I remembered the work of a modernist painter called Joseph Albers. He was part of the Bauhaus school. And... He had produced a series of work. In fact, he spent most of his life painting a series of work that was simply squares within squares. So coloured squares inside other coloured squares. And he called this series of paintings, he did over 2,000 of them, homage to the square. 
and he was really interested in the relationships between colours. He was really interested in the juxtaposition of colours and how they change when you put them next to other colours, how sometimes the squares looked like they were receding, sometimes they looked like they were coming towards you, and he was really fascinated by that phenomena. And so I thought, yeah, I could really, I could really use that as a starting point for a new project. So the granny square really lends itself to that way of working because it is literally made up of squares within squares. So what I've done is I've developed a blanket that has a kind of a design formula to it. So I give people a framework, I give people a concept, but everybody that makes the blanket chooses their own colours. So every blanket is different. The basic formula is that there are five main colours in the centre of the blanket and there are four main colours that make up the border and there are there's one or more additional colours that I call the wild colours. So these centre colours, they should be a group of colours that travel very easily from one through to the next colour, through to the next colour. And that can be done tonally. So it could be done by moving from a very dark red, for instance, through to a paler tone, lighter, lighter, lighter. Or it could be done as if you were travelling around the colour wheel. So you could start with one colour and then that colour could gradually move into a different colour. So we could go from red, orange, yellow, even into green. And then the border colours are colours that, again, they have a relationship with each other. So they may be similar tonally or they may all be versions of the same hue, so they might be different tones of, of green. And then clearly the wild colours are there just to kind of really bring it to life and add a, add a little bit of spice and, and drama to the mix. So this course I developed in 2017, and this was the first online course that I ran, and I now have nearly 500 people that are working on this project online. So this has been a really, really exciting project for me. And then after homage to the Granny Square, same group of students, same question, what's next, Sue? Same response, I'm, I don't know. Um, but I did have a vague idea. I had some images that were rattling around in my head and uh, this was 2018 and I was thinking a lot about the Dutch masters painters, particularly a female painter called Rachel Rausch and I absolutely adored her still life paintings which were very melancholic, very dramatic, really dark backgrounds illuminated subject matter, so all about the contrasts. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to design something that had that kind of aesthetic to it. Um, somebody had said, how about hexagon Sue? And I thought that kind of lends itself to some quite interesting floral shapes. So that was my next project, to use the Dutch masters as my inspiration and to use the hexagon as the, the format for, for, the, for the overall construction. And so when I began designing, um, essentially what I did was I took images of lots of different still life paintings and I took sections from each of those paintings and I experimented with my Kaleidoscope app and by mirroring those, those small sections of, of paintings. And I absolutely loved the effects that I was getting. Everything always looks balanced. Whenever you mirror a design, if 
you mirror something particularly four ways, like this is done, it always looks balanced. And so that's kind of where I started with that concept. And so clearly colour is really important to the overall aesthetic of this design. I really wanted it to have the, the drama, you know, what was it that attracted me to those paintings originally and could I achieve that in this crochet blanket? So I knew that I'd have to have a really full range of tones in, in my yarns. Um, so I'd need to go from the very darkest colours right down to the very lightest colours. I knew that I'd need my background colours, so when you look at the Dutch Masters paintings, very dark backgrounds, so that's, you know, what, what these sections are all about. Um, and then the colours of the subject matter, so in this case the subject matter are the flowers. So again, a good, really broad range of tonal values for the flowers, going from the very darkest reds right through to these very pale, really pretty pinks. So I've got a collection of background colours that also run from very dark to very light. A collection of flower colours. And they're also what I call my leaf colours. They don't have to be the colour of leaves, um, but I've got three colours that are my leaf colours. So seven background colours, six flower colours, and three leaf colours. What this blanket really taught me, particularly, was how beautiful these dark colours can be. These colours are very easy to work with, you know, we all enjoy working with these very pretty colours. But actually, how many of us really spend time considering the, the beauty of these really dark, melancholic colours? And by using these dark colours together, you really have to look closely at the subtleties of the colour. So I really enjoyed, I, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed working with those dark colours. And then the way the composition was put together, typically with a blanket you might start on one end and kind of work your way up through to the, to the end, or you might be making um, square motifs and joining them all together with this one, I started with this section here, which I called the garland. So this very light section, um, which is made up of different types of hexagons. So we created this first, and then worked inwards, and filled the centre here, and then worked outwards towards the corners where it starts to get darker and darker. And just with the homage to the granny square blanket, everyone chooses their own colours. So um, 16 colours is quite a lot to work with. Um, so that's quite a challenge at the beginning of this project to, to choose your colours, but obviously that's kind of my role and I, and I help people with all their colour decisions. And, um, and some people have inverted the colours as well. So some people have made their blankets um, so that they're very light in the corners um, and very dark here in the garland. And again, it's really, it, it's a real pleasure to see how my online students can make this blanket their own and um, come up with their own interpretations of it. And then after Wallflowers, I really wanted to use the idea of this floral garland and use it to create a three-dimensional floral yoke. I kept visualising it uh, as a garment. And so this is Gloria. This is my latest online course. And with this, with this design, I've also used the concept of flower colours, background colours, wild colour. So in the floral motifs, I've got three tones of the flower colours. So I've got yellow, this dark orange, and this kind of burnt um, red colour. And then in the background, 
I've got a very pale grey, I've got a really pretty lilac and then obviously this dark um, purple that makes up the body of the work and then I've got these wild colours here which is this um, lovely um, bright green. So um, th this is my latest challenge and this is ongoing as we speak. Welcome back. I hope you really enjoyed seeing Sue's gorgeous designs and hearing her talk about her design process. There's a lot more for you to see and learn in part two of the interview, which is at the end of the program. And Sue is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount off all her self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. So thanks very much to Sue. So we're in Bring and Brag now with me because I've finished my hooked rug. Um, in episode 128, we featured a Canadian textile artist called Diane Fitzpatrick, and she's famous for her beautiful hooked rugs. We brought two of her rug hooking kits back home with us. I chose this one called Lady with Her Dog, and I adapted it a bit to be Jack and I walking in the woods. Mum got this set, which shows three knitters, and she's going to turn that image into her, me, and Dad sitting on the couch and knitting together. I think this is a really cool idea. So the kits come with some simple instructions and tips on how to start rug hooking, as well as this hook, some mixture of yarn and strips of material. This is an example of my kit here, so you can see how big it is and all the different kinds of yarns yeah. and fabrics. Yeah. Uh, and the motive itself is drawn onto the burlap already, but you can always make changes to it if you want to. Here's a picture of my finished rug next to the original. You can see that I made quite a few changes. I used most of the yarn provided in the kit, but I also used some of our leftover yarn when I wanted to change the colour. For example, the original kit had a gorgeous curly glossy orange yarn for the lady's hair, but my hair is brown with a little bit of red, so I put together two strands of brown yarn and one strand of orange yarn to get the colour closer to my hair colour. I also changed the hat to a light blue and turned it into a beret because I have a beret that I really like. And I used some leftover Rowan felted tweed in different shades of green for the grass. I also made the dog look more like Jack and gave him a collar. I struggled a bit with the grass. In the beginning I combined too many yarns in a small area making it look chaotic. So I had to unpick it a few times until I was satisfied. But what I like about the final version is that the several large areas are covered with a single type of yarn which looks calmer. Rug hooking really is like painting with yarn. It's easy to create a beautiful picture if you al already have some painting skills. Mm. Uh, variegated yarns are perfect because they do all of the work for you by blending together different colours seamlessly. But it's also fun to combine several strands of thinner yarn in different colours and this creates a heathered effect. I did this for lots of sections, so not just for my hair. For example, I wanted the trees to have just a shimmer of blue, copper and dark green. So I combined these colours here, which some of them I think are even Alice Starmore colours, yeah. um, together with the grey and the black yarn for the trees. Yeah, and I think They're that looks quite colors. pretty. Yeah. yeah, I actually found that choosing and combining the yarns and colors was the most fun and creative, but also the most challenging aspect of rug hooking because the technique itself is actually pretty straightforward. Um, so this was my first time rug hooking, and I'd like to share my experience with you as a beginner and summarize some of the advice that I got from Deanne and other sources on the internet. My tip number one is to widen the hole. Rug hooking is very simple. You hold the yarn underneath, punch your hook through the burlap from above, and then you pull the yarn through to the top. And when you punch your hole through the burlap, it's a good idea to widen the hole. I do this by pushing the fabric in one or two directions with my hook, and this makes pulling the fabric through the hole much easier because you're reducing the friction between your material and the burlap. At first I was worried I'd end up with lots of wide holes so my loops would just slip out again, but with burlap, when you loosen the next hole, you simultaneously tighten the first one. So this wasn't a problem. My tip number two is to space the loops. Deanne says to hook into every second or third hole, because if you hook into every hole, then the burlap mat will curl up instead of lying flat. 
I found it a lot more difficult than I had expected to space my loops because I often ended up with these empty spaces in between my loops. For this reason, it is easier, to me at least, to hook with chunky fluffy yarn instead of thinner yarn or even strips of material because the chunky yarn tends to bloom and fill all the gaps naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Now my tip number three concerns the loop height. Deanne says to make your loops roughly five to eight millimeters high. Um, in the beginning, I was making mine way too short, but over time I noticed that it made sense to pull my loops slightly higher than I actually wanted them to be because as you create the next loop, this can take away some of the yarn from the previous loop. And in the worst case, you've completely undone your previous loop, something that's very frustrating. But another way to reduce this problem is by widening the hole beforehand. So tip number one again. Yeah, my tip number four is to work from thin to thick. So initially I started by hooking the sky with this chunky white and blue yarn. And then I wanted to fill in the tree branches with the thinner black or dark yarns. But I found it really difficult to see what I was doing because the chunky yarn was blocking my view, especially on these thin branches here. So I ripped it all out again and I worked on the smaller intricate details first before moving on to the chunkier larger sections. I don't know if this is general good advice, but it made things a lot easier for me to work in this order. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, next My tip. Tip number five is to spread your yarns evenly across the canvas. Mm. Deanne advises you to do so because if you run out of a specific yarn, you can fill in the gaps with a different color and it will still look balanced, which is really important. So I tried to do this with the sky when using all the different colors. Uh, yeah, so when you've finished hooking your rug and you want to trim the burlap, as you can see, it's quite a lot, it's good for you to leave an extra five centimeters because then you can fold it over to hem it and hide the raw edges. Also, you can block your rug. To do so, mm. you cover it with a cloth and then you steam it with an iron uh, and that will help even out the loops a little. So we haven't done that yet? No. Okay. Yeah. So overall, I, I'm pretty happy with my first hook to rug. Um, I do think that I made some mistakes with the color choices because you can see that this lovely pastel, like really light, bright sky goes very well together with the dark uh, trees. That's what Deanne basically gave me. Um, but I chose these sort of orangey yellow grass colors. Not really. Yeah. They just don't yellow work. Green. Yeah. The, the, yeah. So that these greens just don't quite work with these pastel colors. It's like two different seasons yeah so in hindsight i should have chosen different either a different sky or a different grass but yeah. it's still pretty cool for your first hooked yeah, rug i enjoyed it and very i much. think people are really going to want to have a look at the back side yes. so there you go it's very interesting there's the back side <laughs> Hi, my name is Noma and I live in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm so excited to be sharing my knitting journey with you today. So I started knitting when I was around five years old and I was mainly taught by my aunt who was mainly doing some custom knitting for people in our neighborhood. So I was very fascinated with all the work that she was doing every day and I asked her to teach me how to knit. So um, from a very early age, it's, I think it's around the age of six, I was already helping her with her custom orders that she was doing. I started out by helping with just knitting the button bend, but later on I was able to help her with the front panel of a pullover or sometimes knitting one side of a cardigan while she does the other or working on one sleeve while she's working on the other sleeve. So from a very young age, I had to learn a lot about gauge and tension and making sure that the way I knitted meshed hers perfectly because we're knitting for other people and the work had to ve look very cohesive and look like it had been knit by one person. So it was a very fascinating and very quick learning experience for me in terms of knitting and getting gauge. So at the time, we we're mainly knitting garments made with cables, textured stitches, and I was very fascinated with the satin sleeve. Most of the knitting that we did had satin sleeves at the time, and we mainly did cardigans. So I really enjoyed the process of watching her fit in the sleeve of a garment, because when you're holding it up and looking at it, it doesn't look like 
it could actually fit into a garment, but it was so fascinating to see how it fitted well into the garment and how well it looked when it was worn. So even up to now, the satin sleeve is still one of my favorite construction methods. So um, when I was in grade one, the jumper that I wore at school was half made by me. So I contributed to the knitting of my own garments and to those of my family members. So mostly I'll work on half of the garment and she'll work on the other. So it was around 1995 when knitting sort of slowed down or even stopped in some areas. So I remember that at our school we're told that by the time in 1996 we were expected to come to school with machine knitted jumpers which were knit in fisherman rib and v and had a v-neck shape. So everyone had to wear a similar uh, garment. And it was at that time that you would really find yarn in the shops and most yarn shops closed. And I didn't knit much around that time. And I only picked it up in 2009 when I met a friend who was also interested in knitting and we started knitting together. So later on I joined Ravelry and in 2012 I was already doing a lot of knitting because I was planning my wedding and working a very stressful job. So it was a way to relax and to enjoy the rest of the evening. And then in 2013, my daughter was born and I stopped working in the corporate space and I started designing my own knits. And I published my first pattern in 2014. And now I have over 160 designs and I'm still so excited about knitting, designing, and currently I'm enjoying designing garments wraps and I've developed a love for socks and I've been designing those. So I'm so excited to be able to share my knitting with the rest of the world. And I'm so excited to actually share a couple of designs that I've been working on with you right now. The Esther T is named after Esther Matlang. Esther is a South African artist who does Ndebele artwork and her work has been featured all over the world. She mainly works in primary colors and very large motifs that are used to paint Ndebele huts where the Ndebele people live in, some fabrics and even some beadwork. So when I was designing this top, I wanted to use neutral colors to make the garment more wearable. And I also had to scale down the designs so that the top can be easier to grade. So this top is worked from the top down and different yoke depths have used more or less motifs of the pattern. And then when you get to the bottom of the garment, they are the design is more vertical in order to lengthen the upper body and to give the eye some rest from the busy motifs at the top. It's a very fun design to knit. You have engaged right from the beginning. Some of the motifs include three colors or even four, but mostly you'll be working with just two colors on the garment. I excluded sleeves on the garment because I didn't want it to get too busy. It's a very quick and easy to knit garment and it is worked on fingering weight yarn. The Kanyesa cardigan is one of the most versatile pieces that I have designed. So the garment can be worn with dresses, both long and short, and it can also be worn over pants with a longer top or camisole and it fits just right. So it's a very easy one to work. It's worked from the top down and it's got regular sleeves and once you separate the body and the sleeves the body is worked with a simple cable pattern and at the bottom is um, twisted ribbing. So I've used twisted ribbing for the button bands for the sleeve edges and the body edges for a more elegant finish. The cardigan doesn't have any buttons it's open at the front so that it can fit in with so many pieces in the wardrobe. So the garment is quite easy to knit and even an advanced beginner can also pull this one off and an adventurous beginner can also pull it off. So it works up very quickly in DK weight yarn and it's still a very favorite piece in my wardrobe. And it because it is open at the front, it elongates the body and it fits in well with fitted or flowy garments as well. I have always loved waterfall cardigans, but every time I went to the shops to buy one, I noticed that most of them had too much fabric at the front, and with my height, I always looked like I was drowning in the garment. So I decided to design my own that would have less fabric, but will still have that waterfall cardigan feel. So the tea is 
the design that I came up with, and I'm so excited to be sharing it with you today. So let's talk about the construction. So the garment is, is started at the back of the neck, right at the center. We we'll start with the collar and you need a certain length and you also, you pick up the stitches here from the provisional cast on and you need the other direction and these are placed on hold. Then the back of the garment is picked up and worked downwards and you do the same for the front whilst working on the collar at the same time. So the front of the garment is straight and there are no increases here. So what I did was that for the top part of the garment, I worked it in a vertical lace pattern that is very simple and it's zigzag in shape. So when I was separating the top and the bottom part and changing the lace pattern, initially I tried using a gutter stitch uh, separation, but it didn't look so good and I tried to just knit and separate them, but you won't tell the difference. So at the end of the day, I decided to bind off all the stitches and then pick them up again at the back at the back loop of the garment and thus creating this very fancy and beautiful and sturdy line. So um, the bottom part is worked in a chevron lace pattern and there's an eye cord edging so that there is a very elegant finish. I didn't want to use gutter stitch or any other stitch. I wanted the finish to be very elegant at the front and simplistic. And at the bottom, there are very few rows of twisted ribbing so that the cardigan doesn't roll over at the bottom. So I really love this garment and I love the way it turned out. And so because I wanted the lace pattern to pop, the sleeves are worked in stockinette stitch and they are set in. And as I mentioned in the earlier on that I love a certain sleeve because it gives that fitted look in the garment. I wanted the top part to be very fitted because the bottom part had so much fabric and it was going to be loose fitting. So it sits very well on the body. The fairy leaves wrap was my favorite project to knit ever. And it only took me four days to work on this wrap because it was that much fun to knit. So the wrap is started right in the middle with a provisional cast on. The leaf pattern is worked in one direction and at the end the center stitch continues being knitted down and the rest of the stitches are worked in cutter stitch. And as you work down to the end of the wrap, when you get towards the edging, there's a very simple pattern that is worked with decreases and increases and yarn overs and a bobble bind off. So it's very simple and easy to work once the lace pattern is done. And then when you pick up the stitches here on the first row that you work, you also incorporate bobbles so that at the end of the day, you don't even see where the joining is. So when you look at the wrap, it looks continuous. You can't tell that it was started right at the center. So the second half is also worked the same way up to the bobble bind off. So this is a very fun to knit project. It's worked in an iron weight and on five millimeter needles and it works up pretty fast. And as I mentioned earlier, I only worked on this in four days because it was so enjoyable to knit. And there were the challenging bits and the relaxing bits and the knitting. And that's what makes a project very enjoyable for me. And I'll be very happy to knit another one in a more neutral color. The Mafati Rep is named after the tallest mountain in South Africa. The rep was featured in the winter 2019 Pom Pom Kotele, and it features simple brioche, cables, and reverse docking So the rep is worked from the bottom up, and you start off with, the, with brioche ribbing at the bottom, and then you proceed to the cables on the ends and one in the center. So the rest of the stitches are worked in reverse stocking it on the right side and on the wrong side, it's plain stocking it stitch. So the wrap gives the knitter an opportunity to experiment with simple cabling and working the brioche stitch. So most of the rows are mindless knitting except for the one where you actually do the cabling. So it's a very fun and relaxing knit and it also gives the knitter an opportunity to show off some very beautiful yarn that makes the cables and the reverse docking it pop. So for this rep, I was very fortunate to work with a South African yarn dyer, Medlin of Yama Fiber Arts. So the yarn was used for this rep to represent South Africa in the knitting community, and I'm so excited about it. Last year, I was focusing on colorwork designs. This year, my focus is on building a capsule wardrobe. 
the wardrobe that's going to be versatile and fit in the wardrobes of most knitters. So whether it's someone who works in the corporate space and needs to dress in a smart, casual way, or it's a stay-at-home mom who has to do school runs, walk the dog, grocery shopping, run other errands, or even go out for dinner with friends. I want to do knits that are going to fit into the wardrobe and can be worn with various pieces. So you can be wearing your smart pants to work, and when you get home, just change to a pair of jeans and walk the dog and still keep on your sweater or your cardigan. And as always, I'll continue focusing on all sizes with the ends of the spectrum in, in the forefront because extra small and the much larger sizes usually have fit issues so I'll be focusing a lot on those so that knitters in those ranges can also get well fitted garments. So the whole point of a capsule wardrobe is to work with colors and garments that suit your lifestyle and what you are actually drawn to the most. So in my case, I'm drawn to neutral colors and that's what I reach for in my wardrobe more than anything else. So I'll be focusing on neutral colors in my wardrobe. And I'm so excited to be sharing those knitting plans with you and to actually share the designs as the year progresses. So thank you so much, Andrea and Madeline for having me on the show. in music lovers you've just been listening to the South African gospel choir Soweto singing Sichaba and I was totally thrilled to find that wonderful music so that I could put it together with Noma's designs yeah. and it's it's quite remarkable that Noma was matching her aunt's knitting gauge at the age of seven and knitting professionally and I think most people's stories of how they learned to knit is are fairly similar so it was a real highlight to hear Noma's unusual story <laughs> And I think her fairy leaves shawl, you're yeah. going to knit, aren't you? Yeah, I really love that yeah. design. I think it's super cool. Yeah, I love it as well. And it's in Aran weight, so it's going to knit up really fast. That's good. And Noma is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount off her self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. And as Noma said, she designs sweaters, shawls, socks and accessories – and she loves to design pieces that are easy to work on and at the same time are exciting and not tedious for the knitter. And her designs have to meet the criteria of being functional, simple and elegant. So thanks very much to Noma. Every month we have a live event with a special guest for our Shetland patrons. The event is recorded and then edited and then it's available as an audio podcast for both our Shetland and Merino patrons. So last Sunday our special guest was Natasha Hornby who we featured in episode 127. We had an interview there and, she, and Natasha also sat on the couch with me. So that was a fun event and in January... Our special guest was Janet from the Green Gable Alpaca Farm on Prince Edward Island in Canada. That was a very fascinating and informative interview because yeah. Janet has become an authority on breeding alpacas for superior fleeces. So for years, she's been sending fibre samples from each of her animals to a special lab for analysis. And now she has a massive data bank that she uses 
uh, as information to help her make decisions on how to breed and how to design her yarns. So that interview has been edited and it's available for Shetland and Merino patrons to listen to. So if you haven't heard it, make sure you go and listen to it because it really is fascinating. And Janet is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 20% discount off all the products in her online store. So she has a beautiful range of custom milled alpaca yarn that's exceptionally soft and that she hand dyes herself. And she also sells ready-made alpaca socks alpaca inner soles and other alpaca products. So thanks very much to Janet for the patron discount. So we'd like to remind you that producing fruity knitting is only possible through the financial support of patrons and it is very inexpensive to become a patron. You can do so for just the cost of one coffee per month and every single patron makes a big difference to us. So if you are watching, please do support the show by becoming a patron and thank you to all the wonderful patrons who have kept the show going so far. So now it's time for us to say goodbye. And coming up next is part two of our interview with Sue Matten. Yeah, thanks for spending time with us. And we'll see you again in March. Bye. Bye. Sometimes crafters think of themselves as uncreative and you love to encourage people to move away from just mechanically reproducing something to becoming more confident in their own creativity and Sue has some very short playful activities in her courses that just help to demystify the creative process. So can you share some of those ideas with us now? Of course. Good. Uh, so with the homage to the Granny Square course, it's all about colour. So I always start that course with quite an in-depth section on colour theory and I encourage people to paint a colour wheel. So most people know what a colour wheel looks like and most people kind of understand the concept of it. But I think until you actually paint a colour wheel, you use the paints and you actually experience and witness the the, the way that the colours change, those subtle nuances in colour as you move around the colour wheel, that's when you really start to understand the relationships of colour. And then by obviously positioning it in a colour wheel like this, you can see the relationships, you can see the colours that are opposites and the colours that are near each other. So I would always encourage people to do a colour wheel. Um, so that's definitely where I would start. And just, yeah, like you said, like you can see this yellow here, it's just got the vaguest touch of green in it, hasn't it? Absolutely. It, yeah. And I think by positioning your colours like this, you can see why... A red, for instance, might be described as a blue red, yes. or it might be described as an orange red, and why perhaps this red might sit more happily with these colours yeah. than it might with these colours. Yeah. And so, as with most things, it's about learning the rules, isn't it? It's, but it's kind of getting a set of rules under your belt, and then when you understand the rules, then you can start to really play with them, and mm. then you can start to break those mm. rules. Um, and quite often, it's the blank page that people are frightened of, don't know where to start. And so these are colour exercises that I do um, in my creat Creativity Firestarter course. Mm -hmm. These are just icebreakers. They're five-minute exercises. Um, and the, But there's a formula to how you do it. So you choose one set of colours that are very close to each other on the hue circle. And then you choose one or two other colours that are opposites mm -hmm. on the hue circle. And you just enjoy yourself. So you're not planning. You're not overthinking. It's like abstract expressionism. Mm -hmm. And it just takes five minutes to produce a really exciting, really dynamic piece of work. It's not a finished painting. Um, 
it is really just there to to enable you to enjoy working with colour. Yeah, and there's a, a reason why it's a five-minute project, isn't it? Absolutely. I think it is once we start overthinking, questioning, that's when we get stuck. And so particularly with my Creativity Firestarter course, it's all about very quick activities that you could just you work your way through in a non-judgmental way. Mm-hmm. So you're not asking yourself, does this work? What will people think of it? Mm. You're just doing the work. You don't have time. Don't have time. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's, the watch is on and it's like, get it on the paper as soon as possible. Exactly, isn't it? Yeah. exactly that. And then you've added some black at the end. So the black's really just there, just as a way of kind of generating some focal points. Um, and quite often I find that people will, will feel like these are the most exciting pieces of work that they've done in a really long time. Mm. And quite often you don't get that kind of dynamic joy when you overplan things. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here's some different examples of them. So you've used the colours... The, the red, orange and pink, they're all very neighbouring colours, aren't they? And then you've got the opposite blue. Is that correct? That's right. Perhaps if we look at the colour wheel again, we can see um, the relationships of the colours. So um, when I talk about colour rules, one of the first things that we learn are the terminology, the, the words that we use to describe colours. So we talk about analogous colours. So these are colours that are close to each other mm-hmm. on the colour wheel. And they're always very harmonious. Mm. They're very easy to Mm -hmm. work with. But once you start introducing opposite colours or Mm complementary colours into that group, then you start getting really dynamic colour kind of relationships. Yeah. So with this... You see that there, can't you, that blue? Exactly. So we've got a group of colours here that are analogous. And then we've got opposite colours here that are being drawn in, the blues and, and the turquoise. So that's why it's so kind of visually dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. It's always about harmony and discord. Harmony and discourse, exactly. Yes. Good. So what comes next? What's another activity? This one looks interesting. <laughs> okay. So again, this goes back to, um, you know, the paralysis that can set in when you're confronted with a blank page. Where do I start? Everyone can doodle. We all do this. You know, we're, we're waiting on the phone and we're filling our sketchbooks with, with really quick little doodles. So this is really, again, an icebreaker. It's a way of just enjoying moving your pen or your pencil on the page and again not over planning not overthinking and then once we've kind of freed up a little bit then we can start to think about well what would happen if we framed some of these little exercises and so we've got small frames and each of those is filled with a little doodle And then each of these little doodles is potentially a point of departure for a design. It's the starting point for a design. It actually looks lovely like that framed. (laughs) I know, and they're great fun to do. And I do these as timed exercises as well. So these are, I think, 90 seconds on each one. So again, you don't have time to think about composition. You don't have time to plan. Yes, what I find when you do an activity like that, you don't, like you said, you don't have that time to think and a feeling takes over. You just sort of have a mood. Exactly, yeah. And it almost takes on yeah. a personality yeah. of, it, of its own. And then also the other thing that I like to do is a left-handed doodle. So these are left-handed doodles. And, you know, you would think that you wouldn't be able to to draw with your non-dominant hand. But it's amazing that it has almost a different personality. Yeah. And I always re- I'm always very surprised and delighted at, at how how much I enjoy working with my left hand. It's more energetic. It is. And it's slightly got that frantic look about yes. it. <laughs> yes, they are a little bit manic. They're great <laughs> fun to do, though. And what's some of the feedback you've had from people who would think of themselves not as an artist at all or or couldn't draw when they do this? 
what did they say? That I mean, I've been absolutely amazed by the positive feedback that I've had. You know, the people that have said, I've, I've always thought of myself as an uncreative person. This is what I was told when I was at school. And a lot of it is because the 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 exercises that they set were very prescriptive mm. draw this still life you know draw this object which is a very difficult thing to do but this is anyone can do mm. this mm. yeah um, great so another element that um i think is really important in any aspect of design so we've thought about color and line with the doodles so this is about space and shape so positive and negative spaces we often think about the the positive shape as being the most important aspect of a design but nothing is ever seen on its own mm. you know there's always mm. something behind it mm. or something next to it so other shapes uh, are generated so this is encouraging people to look at the positive and the negative um, and then these become developed into collages. And again, anyone can work with collage. Um, it's not particularly about having a drawing skill. Um, it's just looking at, at shapes and beginning to develop repeating patterns. Yeah, the, like the negative or the shadow is just as influential, like you said, on the... It, it defines the actual object, doesn't it? Yeah. You can it, look at it that way. Absolutely. And also how you use colour as well. So, you know, which side is light, which side is dark. and um, It will make an image recede or, or move away. Um, so these are, these are all, again, very quick exercises. And then from these, we, we start to look at quite fun little exercises that um, are all about cutting, folding and cutting and generating repeating patterns. So we start with these fun little um, paper dollies and then we start to develop some quite interesting um, shapes which when you lay them, you overlay them on top of different coloured backgrounds, mm. you can very quickly generate lots of different pattern ideas. Definitely. And you also uh, use an app on your phone to mirror images, don't you, to show people how you can take almost anything and it can be created into a beautiful uniform pattern. Yeah, I am rather addicted to the Kaleidocam <laughs> app. I do spend rather too much time on that. But, yeah, it is amazing that with one very, very small little motif, repeat it several times, and you can very easily and very quickly generate a very powerful repeating pattern. Again, it's a very quick, very hands-on activity. You don't need, you know, lots of yeah. expensive yeah. equipment um, but it is about, you know, what happens when you see it on different backgrounds and with different colours. Um, so, yeah, so that, that was the paper cutting exercise. And then also using found materials, because I think often people are put off by not having the right equipment or mm -hmm. feeling that it might be very expensive. And actually, I, I like to encourage people to use whatever you can find around the house. So found materials, found pieces of paper. It looks like so much fun. <laughs> it, and it, it is. It's great fun. Yeah. And, and, that, and that, that is one of the points, you know, of all of these activities that, you know, you do it with a light heart. You, mm. you, you're you're non-judgmental. Mm. It's, it's, it's a fun activity. Yeah. Now, two of your blankets um, actually use the Rowan felted tweed. And so I'd like you to tell us why you've chosen to use that yarn. But also, can you, since we're doing activities and things, just to show the viewers new ways of how to look at and work with colour, can you put together uh, some different runs of colour using the Rowan Felter Tweed and just talk us through your thought process again so we can sort of get an idea of why you make the decisions that you do? Of course, yes, I'd love to do that. Okay, so yeah, I can talk you through a few colour runs and I'll talk you through my process. This is kind of how I work when I'm trying to put a new colour palette together. It's really difficult to just pluck a 
new colour palette out of thin air. It's always good to have a starting point, a reference point, and that could be different things. But I think a colour wheel is a really good place to start. So once you've painted your colour wheel and you've familiarised yourself with the placement of the colours, then perhaps start with a little group of analogous colours. So for instance, you could concentrate on a little section here and let's begin by making a little group of these colours. So obviously I can't match my paint colours mm -hmm. um, perfectly. So this is all very approximate. Mm -hmm. um, so I, let's have a little orange. Um, obviously we're going to have some reds. Um, and I'm looking for nice, clear, saturated colours. So obviously with this colour wheel, they're all very clear, bright colours. So at this stage, I'm not looking for anything too kind of grey or muddy. I'm keeping these saturation levels up. So I'm liking those together. And then we've got another red that can go in here. So this is quite a blue red. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of this side of the circle. And then we're moving through these very pure scarlet reds. Obviously, we're now going into the orange. And then I could put um, a yellow on there. But actually, because of these high saturation levels, I really like that. Mm -hmm. And I think even just that would make a really beautiful colour palette. Mm -hmm. So that could be a complete... One in itself. One in itself. Or if we use the rule of complementaries, we could start thinking, well, what's on the other side? So if I was going to introduce a complementary colour, what would that be? And it might be something like this. So you would probably wouldn't use too much of it. Um, just a little flash of it to really kind of make Bring those. Bring out these. Yeah. Exactly. That is gorgeous. And then we could do it the, the other side then. So what would happen if perhaps if we looked at these blues, um, blues and greens. So again, I'm looking for colours that have got nice, bright saturation levels. So anything that looks blue or turquoise or green. And I'll make a little run of colours. So this was almost as if I was moving around the colour wheel from the blues into the greens. And I'm rather liking that selection. Um, or I could take this out. It's, this is quite a minty Yes, green. I was going to say that. That's an unusual green, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is an unusual green. So I'm not sure that that's the right green. And I would perhaps put this one on the end. So we're moving into the yellows yeah. a little bit yeah. there. If we wanted something to just really lift that palette, what would we be looking at? So something that was kind of opposite. So we're going back to these warm colours, maybe a little pink in there. Maybe one pink by itself isn't enough. Maybe we could have a couple of pinks in there. So the point is that this is your main colour palette. Yeah. And these are here just to add a little bit of spice, to just kind of sprinkle into that colour palette, if you like. I can see that. I'm interested how you've got these two colours together because you might think that they're quite a big difference in value as well. But, I mean, they look beautiful, but what's your thinking with that? I think if... It, for, for me, if they live together quite happily on, on the colour wheel, I, I see, I, I do agree with you, that's quite a dark, that is quite a dark green. Um, but I think because they're all in a similar, they occupy a similar section on the mm -hmm. colour wheel, I think that they can work. A lot of this is just trial and error, yeah, really. Yeah. It's So when I'm playing with colours, I'm doing a lot of this. You know, do I like this? Does this work? And what I'm looking for is an emotional response to the way that those colours look. You know when you've got it right because you can feel it. It, it literally mm -hmm. makes your heart sing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll just think, oh, I love those together. Um, and then 
So, so those are all very bright, quite saturated colours. If you've worked with uh, tones, and um, so this is an exercise, for instance, that I do where we're looking at the tone value of colour. So it's not about the hue, red, yellow, orange, green. It's about how dark or light a colour is. So for any colour, we could generate a whole tone value scale of dark mm -hmm. versions and light versions. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is based on yellows. Um, so we could look at light, medium, slightly dark, and then we could even introduce really dark tones. So we could generate a monochrome palette that was really just based on one hue, mm -hmm. green in this case, but we've got a whole range of tones and we could do that with any colour on the spectrum. Also, it might be that you don't want all of that colour. Perhaps you like really neutral colours and you're looking for something that's much softer. So a really good place to start would be with the greys, with your neutral colours. Um, and if you've got a lovely collection of yarn like this, I mean, the Rowan Felted Tweed is absolutely perfect for these exercises. Um, and we could just kind of work our way through some of the more neutral mm -hmm. colours. And quite often it's the colours that look a little bit muddy. You know, the colours that you think, oh, well, I'm not sure about that by itself. But actually, when you put it with a little family of colours, it can really sing. Um, so, you know, don't, don't ignore your neutrals. They're really, really important. Um, so if you've got a collection of yarn at home, if you've got your own stash at home, mm -hmm. I think this is a great activity to just get your yarn out and play with different colour stories. Um, and if you keep this rule of thumb in mind, so your, your, an, your analogous colours and your complementary colours, you really can't go wrong. You said that the Rowan Felted Tweed is very good because it's got so many colours. Is that the only reason you've chosen to work with it or um, what do you like about these colours? I mean, they are very heathery, aren't they? Yes, and I think they're a really interesting. I think it's a really interesting collection of, of yarn and I like it for lots of different reasons. I think the colours are really strong. You mm -hmm. know, they're really, really um, strong and... But but there's nothing brash or harsh about them. They look as if they could almost be natural dyes. Yes. Um, so there's the quality of colour that I really like. But yes, you're right, it has this heathery effect. So within the yarn, there are lots of little specks of other colours, which makes it so easy to pair colours together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a little bits of blue in this pink. There's also blue in this sort of salmon-y colour. Absolutely. And, yeah... Okay. And I think it's just been designed so cleverly that in the collection there are little families of colours that are, you know, they're ready-made collections of colours. So it's it's a fabulous range. So, so I've, I've read through some of your articles that you've written and you do think deeply about human nature and behaviour and how it applies to our crafting. So... And I can imagine when uh, people first look at your beautiful heirloom blankets that um, some people might have a response in that they first of all think, oh, I would so love to crochet that. And then they might feel a little bit overwhelmed at the time commitment involved. And then they might also fear their ability to stick with it, persevere and finish it, even though they might really want the project at the end. So in that context, can you just share some of your very well thought out ideas on resistance, fear and value in crafting? Of course. Three things there, value, fear and resistance. I think value is a really interesting subject um, to discuss, particularly in terms of craft and um, in kind of modern society. We don't always value crafts in the way that I think that they should be. 
So one of the things that I think that we could be doing is making sure that we always use the best quality materials that we can. That's going, going to be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. I always prefer to work with natural fibres. Um, but also I think to think very carefully about the kind of objects that we're making and how many objects we choose to make, how much material we choose to consume. So I would always prefer to make fewer but very beautiful objects that I think will be valued for a long time. And in terms of fear, I think you're right. I think people do look at a big project like my wallflowers, for instance, and maybe find it quite overwhelming and think that they could never achieve something like that. What I would say is to always just break it down into small bite-sized chunks and that's how I run my courses so I release the pattern in small elements so you never have to think about the enormity of the project all you really have to do is to concentrate on that first step mm -hmm. and then moving on to the next step and then everything is achievable if you break it down like that. And one of the reasons why we do crafting anyway is to relax so you can't make your project turn into a stress for you. <laughs> exactly it needs to be enjoyable um, and then the last thing which was resistance and I think that we've all lost our crojo at some point you know we've kind of fallen out of love with whatever project we're working on and so there are several things that you can do to kind of generate an interest in a, in a project again and they're quite simple things like don't overthink it just tell yourself you're going to do it don't have that argument with yourself today I'm going to do my crochet pick it up and do it it's as simple as that just start on the very first start. stitches, yeah. Or sometimes yeah. you might need to set the scene a little bit. Um, so I talk about it in terms of, um, in the restaurant industry, they talk about um, mise en place. Everything's in its place. So set the scene, get your beautiful yarn out, get your beautiful crochet hooks out, and, and just enjoy that. Um, so... And the other thing is um, mise, en scène, mise en scène, which is about the environment that you're working in. So, you know, are you on the right chair? Do you feel comfortable? Have you got something nice to look at? Just little things like mm. that that you can kind of, that, that just help you feel really comfortable and in, enjoy your craft. Yeah. And also with resistance, I've heard you talk about, I mean, we do also have, a resistance to working in new ways, you know, and that's what your little games and activities are about, is to help you get over those initial resistances, or we have resistances to using certain colours and things. Yes, that, yeah, I think you're right. I think that we can build up our own kind of resistance, which is about kind of preconceptions that we might have about what our skills are, you know, and oh, I might not be good enough, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Okay, well, I know from, because I've had a look at uh, Sue's courses, and I know that you're a very good teacher because you can bring simplicity and clarity to abstract concepts, which is a real gift to the crafting community. So I'm very happy to have had you on Fruity Knitting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Good. Just one last quick question before we finish up, and that's just what's next on the horizon for you? Okay, well, I do have a plan. Um, the thing that I love most is working with people, especially in real life. And yeah. Obviously, we haven't been able to do that so much over the last couple of years. Um, just before we went into lockdown, I was running some crochet retreats, so I'd really like to get those started again. Um, and I'd like to run some crochet retreats that allow people to generate their own designs. So I think for lots of people who have done the kits, mm -hmm. they've maybe done my online courses, they're ready to start thinking about doing their own design work. I think people have been surprised at how easily they were able to um, take ownership of my online courses and rather than just replicating my design mm. they've actually turned it into their own piece of work mm. and I think that that's motivated lots of people to to really go down that route.
of designing themselves. That sounds very good. Okay, well, let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye.